Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome you to the workshop 293, Unlocking the Digital Potentials of Developing and Least Developed Countries. My name is Jameson Lulufuye. I'll be your moderator for this workshop. Well, with regard to myself, I'm the CEO of Contemporary Consulting based in Abuja, Nigeria. We work on data centers and uh, mitigate cybersecurity challenges for customers. And we also build platforms. I also happen to be the former chair of the Africa ICT Alliance, founded in the year 2012. Uh, with membership from six African countries. But today, we have 32 African countries as our members. So AFICTA is a private sector-led organization that includes ICT associations, uh, ICT companies, and professionals as well. So all of you here and online, you're all most welcome. Even those in space uh, that could be watching us, you're all most welcome to this uh, special workshop. It's going to be very, very interesting. I have a uh, very formidable uh, panel, and uh, they will do justice to the topic. We're looking at how do we unlock the digital potentials of developing and least developed countries. It's a major issue in internet governance. Uh, internet governance is a very serious issue uh, in the world today, and uh, developing countries do not want to be left behind so that uh, we could be part of the fourth industrial revolution and also uh, bridge the digital divide. Co-moderating with me, is uh, Vivian. Uh, we have Vivian Vihang, uh, Vinaj from Brazil. Uh, Vivian is a uh, private sector. Welcome, Vivian. Thank you. Uh, she will also be doing the reporting for us. And um, the other organizers for this event, uh, we have uh, Afikta. We also have uh, BC uh, ICANN supporting, the ICT Association of Namibia, they're also supporting, the Institute of IT Professionals of South Africa supporting, ETESAL, that is the Egyptian IT Electronic and Software Alliance, they're also supporting, the Kenya Computer Society, they're also supporting this event. It's going to be a town hall, uh, so all of you out there, online, please feel free uh, to send in your input, send in your comments, and your questions, as the case may be. Uh, I will now go ahead to introduce the speakers. Well, immediately to my left is uh, the current chairman of the Africa ICT Alliance is also the CEO of EDRAC, uh, based in uh, Cairo, Egypt. He has uh, extensive experience. Uh, we can say a former cabinet level minister in uh, Egypt. Uh, please join me to welcome engineer Uzam Egamel. Well, uh, next to him is a director in the ICT Bureau in the Republic of Benin, and he's also the director, regional director, we can say, for West Africa of the ICT Foundation. Uh, please join me to welcome Mr. Kusi. Please, Mr. Kusi, you're both welcome. Please, can we put down together? I miss you is representing government. And to my right, 
We have another private sector representative. She is the global head of IBM Hyper Protect Accelerator, focused on empowering early stage entrepreneurs through technology and business acceleration, technology credits, co-marketing, go-to-market strategy, and access to IBM partner ecosystem. Please join me to welcome Melissa Sassi. Melissa. And next to Melissa is uh, another uh, man wearing many caps. Uh, you can say a former minister level uh, in Afghan government and a regulator, chairman of the regulatory authority. And uh, of course, in the civil service, uh, in the non-for-profit uh, non organization, advocacy. So please join me to welcome Professor Mohammed Assisi. And uh, next to him, we have a private sector representative. Many of us are familiar with the Internet Society. And uh, she is the senior advisor to the CEO on infrastructure and connectivity. Please join me to welcome Jane Coven. Jane. Uh, also with us from the private sector, is uh, representing uh, Europe in this panel. Uh, he is the Associate Director, EU Affairs of AT&T. Please join me to welcome Gonzalo Carrico. All right, so next to him also is uh, a man with many hats as well, is from academia. Of course, he has extensive experience in academia and uh, civil society activities, but now he's more into uh, business, okay, private sector, uh, representing South America. is the CEO of Governance Primer, a business and technical consulting firm. Mark, that's it, girl. Mark. Okay, uh, to my left again, so, uh, let me also introduce to Ross, uh, last but not uh, the least, is uh, a lady, well known, a current member of uh, IGF, multi-stakeholder advisory group, and uh, she is representing the not-for-profit uh, organization, civil society. Please join me. Uh, to welcome Chennai Shah, Chair. Chennai Shah, please. Uh, the details, more details of the profile of our robust speakers are online. Um, maybe they can also be projected as uh, they intervene. Well, uh, this session is going to be in two parts. Uh, the first part will be uh, the speakers, they will intervene on the policy questions. Uh, two policy questions for that matter. And uh, after that, within maybe uh, 15 minutes, then we can have another session for the entire audience. So uh, as they speak, please prepare your questions, prepare your comments so that uh, we can have an interactive uh, engagement. Now, our speakers will be responding to the policy questions regard to how do we mobilize policymakers? How do we mobilize them to take the issue of uh, policy that directs digital economy even in the fourth industrial revolution? So the first policy question, how do we best mobilize and challenge policymakers and stakeholders to come together and take constructive steps towards addressing cross-cutting issues. There are so many cross-cutting issues uh, that are like impediments to unlocking uh, the digital potentials of developing and least developed countries. Uh, we missed out in the first industrial revolution. Second, 
Third, uh, but the fourth, we're making all efforts so that we can catch up and uh, the, that we will realize indeed our potentials. The second policy question will be, uh, what are those overhacking uh, things or measures that can guarantee digital inclusion? For example, you're looking at human capital development, which is very essential, labor market development, capacity and capa capability development. What are those things we need to do uh, to enhance the capacity of our youth, enhance the capacity of the labor force so that we don't lose out in the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, well, I'm going to turn to the chair of AFICTA. Uh, as I mentioned, he, he succeeded me. He pushed me out of the chairmanship of uh, AFICTA. So, and we are here, courtesy the chair. I'm going to turn to him, but um, for the benefit of our audience, uh, the idea of Internet Governance Forum uh, evolved from uh, World Summit on Information Society, uh, 2005. Uh, it's one of the major outcome of that uh, summit, and it's an opportunity for us to brainstorm and discuss. So the chair is going to open it up uh, with regard to policy. He has been a policy man, so how do we mobilize them, and what do we need to, to do? Uh, chair Ozam. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Jimson. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, thank you not just for uh, uh, moderating this session, but also for all the efforts you have been doing for a decade now, uh, uh, representing the private sector uh, on, in international uh, different forums uh, and trying to help shaping policy that would uh, really uh, be benefiting uh, developing and these developing countries and Africa especially and for initiating AFICTA and um, and uh, sharing it for the last uh, few years now just to highlight uh, I, I, I have been lucky to have the, the, the experience of working as private sector and also as government a part of my uh, career um, and this give us more information and insight about what is happening uh, and also having the opportunity to, to be a board member of AFICTA uh, since 2012 and then sharing it for, uh, for, two, for almost two years now, uh, give me the opportunity to see across the board uh, different challenges that we are facing related to policy, especially policy related to ICT. Uh, digital transformation is, as mentioned by Dr. Jameson, key uh, to, um, to bring us uh, in the same speed as developed countries uh, and uh, it could happen we can do it the only thing is that uh, first of all we do lack enough information uh, and knowledge about how we can do it uh, and second is that uh, um, uh, we need a lot of capacity building to do that properly and uh, doing it, uh, each country on its own, uh, is quite costly and um, is uh, learning by uh, try and error. And maybe this is an opportunity uh, if we think different and we can collaborate more. This is one of the reasons why AFICTA uh, was initiated to, uh, to um, make a collaborative effort for private business in Africa uh, in shaping uh, policies related to uh, digital transformation in such content. So um, I hope that during this session we would be able to answer how uh, can we really uh, make it faster and easier for developing countries to uh, engage further in policy making activities and uh, which would lead to better uh, implementation of digital transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, our Chair. Uh, appreciate uh, the compliments and uh, grateful that you will continue to uh, run with the button. Uh, let me turn to civil uh, society uh, chair or lady. Um, 
Chennai, Chennai has been in Wealth Foundation as a research manager, focused on gender and digital rights. Uh, Chennai has extensive focus on understanding demand side issues with regard to digital policy from a gender youth perspective in our work. Do you uh, agree with uh, what our chair said in terms of uh, we need to really look at it from the broad perspective? Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think I do agree that we need to look at it from a broad perspective. But at the same time, I do believe that even in the engagement of policymakers, there's a need for evidence-based policy. And this is where I constantly advocate for governments um, to actually support research initiatives and invest in research in their own countries to understand the extent to which people are making use of the internet and accessing it. And I do believe that it requires Funding research will also help demystify the way in which um, governments think that people are only using the internet to go on WhatsApp and nothing productive comes out of it, in particular young people. So I do believe in all of the work that I've done by actually focusing on the demand side aspect, I am now able to point out that even if connectivity is addressed to a certain extent, um, there is the issue around meaningful connectivity, which the Web Foundation is currently working on now. And then we currently have um, the gender digital divide, which is an indication that it is, a, it is about stimulating uptake and addressing social issues that impede from everyone coming online to actually engage in order for the digital economy to actually grow. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to look at uh, evidence-based uh, policy making uh, strategies. Okay. Uh, I will turn to the technical person, um, Jane. Jane Coffin, what, what, from your experience as a technical person, do you think this is the best uh, approach uh, in, in terms of uh, how we engage policymakers? Thank you very much. Um, I used to also be a regulator and a policymaker, so I can give you some ideas on what I used to do. But what I also uh, what I used to look at different websites from some of the technical community companies for inspiration when I needed to learn something. And I would also talk to them because they know the infrastructure better often than a regulator or policymaker might. Maybe not you. But, um, but you learn and you also teach yourself more technical skills as you go and you become more able to um, learn and create better regulations and policies. Because if you're trying to regulate something you don't understand, you could do a very complicated job and you could kill growth and innovation. I saw this happen um, in, a, in a country I was working in um, with mobile networks. Uh, the regulator I was working with didn't understand that the base stations cost about uh, $500,000 at that time. They wanted to deploy a regulation that required the second competitive mobile operator to deploy the network in six months. Well, that was impossible in the country. Although it was a small country and pretty flat, it would have been possible in two years. But they weren't going to make their money back in certain areas to get the return to deploy. If we had gone ahead with this regulation, it would have made no sense. They wouldn't have met the obligations. Everyone would be unhappy. <laughs> and you wouldn't have connectivity out to the people that needed it. So I think one thing I would suggest is the convening events and community building among the people in the country that have to, and experts that might come in. You've got to have a consistent meeting so that people get to know each other. And you can have those hard conversations about deployment but you can also start to work with each other for creative solutions. Um, one thing that is also super helpful is that when, when companies or civil society or technical communities have snapshots of data sets, information on their websites, I used to go take it and I'd attribute it of course, but it would help me explain this up the chain of command to the minister because sometimes ministers need a lot of time to comprehend things or they can take it fast. But if you have layers of data that you can provide to that minister or to the, the chief regulator, it helps. So for anyone out there in industry, your information is very important <laughs> to the people making the decisions and putting the rules and regulations together. So never underestimate 
how well people can take that information and make it easy to find. Little heading would be for government officials. Because <laughs> some people make websites that are impenetrable and you cannot find anything. And we've had this our problem at the Internet Society ourselves. So we're rebooting our website so people can find things. But it's really helpful if you make it really clear. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So that means you, you agree with uh, what Chennai just said. It has to be evidence. So you need to build it based on data and let them see it, get to meet with them. Excellent. Um, I'm going to turn to another government person. Uh, he's been in government for all his life. So, and uh, he's proud to be. So we'd like to hear also from you uh, practically. You know, now you are still in government. So what is, uh, what is your take on, on this uh, subject matter? Kosi Amesino. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think we must be unanimous he here. Uh, SET development, digital technology is very important for a lot of area of our development, maybe in Africa, in anywhere in the world. Frontier uh, is never exist from north and south. They have never the limited space where we have attained the same scientific database now, currently. But the lack and the loss level of mobilization and motivation of decision makers reduce their digital appropriation is the thing we, we, see, we saw for the 10 years, past 10 years time. And for my understanding, nothing major can never be done in the digital areas without constant support of public decision makers. If we don't have that person who are charging development strategy, we don't have them on the table, we don't have all the time the solution to be in the part of our development uh, strategy making. I think actors are also collaborate less in the sense of the general interest to unlock the digital potential for our countries uh, in Africa globally. I think collaboration is one key where we must make all our efforts. We have, I have, for example, one of my guys in Benin who talk about strategy with partnership where we have government, the foreign major group, the private sector also in, in local areas. We must work together to build the strategy for development. Maybe it is for their self normally because we have technology in the north, we don't have it in the south. We must work together to make the thing for our countries. For to, to have creation the privilege for our local people who need to go in the technology space. It's important for us to see, is it scale available locally? If not, we bring the international group to the board and work with them. If we have a skill in the, in the local space, it's important to let our local people prove their capacity. It's important also to let the international level people to bring us the strategy who we can relocate the center of excellence for the digital making in our different areas. That is my point of view. Thank you very much. Uh, it's like you are, as a government person, you are saying that if government doesn't move, nothing moves. 
and then government needs to be mobilized. So who is to mobilize government? Who, who should they mobilize government? Government should be able to mobilize themselves. So who have, how have you been mobilized? How do you get mobilized to do all the things you do, bring in the private sector? We know government have power. It can mobilize everybody. But sometimes government need to be supported because funding, government don't have funding every time. The major group have many funds to bring on the table to let us make job together. Thank you very much. Uh, I will turn to the private sector again. You know, government is saying maybe they need uh, funding, they need uh, international cooperation. Okay, so uh, Gonzalo, uh, from the experience of AT&T, uh, as it as it worked, you know, with Global South. Thank you. Thank you very very much, Chair, for having me here today. Um, I was I was um, thinking about the first question, and I, I actually listening to the other speakers, I I, I found it very very interesting, and, and I have a, a sort of a, an answer, an answer, a right answer for that is flexible regulatory frameworks, investment, and innovation. I will bring some, some examples of what we are doing uh, in other regions. Um, for instance, the mobile ecosystem in Latin America has been catching up the digital transformation trend with economic growth, innovation technologies, and consumer preferences all taking, uh, playing a part on this. Uh, we see that uh, increased connectivity there is opening new opportunities for economies to become more productive, expand opportunities for entrepreneurship, and drive inclusive economic growth. So what you see there nowadays is that providers um, ramp up investments in distribution capabilities, on-demand services, as well as uh, on various content forms, including original series in, uh, in, in main languages, as Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, it happens to have a Portuguese Brazilian here uh, speaking. So the point then is that the industry needs room to develop and mature through the support of light touch and flexible regulatory frameworks. We need especially a holistic vision and approach to the digital transformation that creates the regulatory predictability needed to drive investment and innovation. That's, that's really key. I, I can bring uh, some, some examples of our work uh, um, in, in that region is that in one hand, for instance, in, uh, in several Latin American countries, the burden of complying with fragmented policy frameworks from multiple regulatory bodies when trying to provide an integrated set of services is substantial and becomes a barrier for, for, for innovation and to make business. In some other countries, old regulations, for instance, still impose cross-ownership restrictions that impede investment uh, in integrated services. On the other hand, we have another example, um, the mobile revolution that helped the United States become a global leader in tech innovation was the direct outcome of deliberate, deliberate and wise government policy established more than 20 years ago. Also in Mexico, he has worked hard in the last few years to implement similarly flexible policies, which has had led to a transformative investment by at and for instance, and the creation of at and Mexico. So you have here already a couple of ideas. But some points to keep in mind um, when, when designing a policy framework that encourages investment and technology and innovation. First, providing market access by reducing, reducing restrictions on foreign investments, enabling cross-border data flows, preventing data localization, protecting consumers, cybersecurity, very important, ensuring due process in lawmaking, promoting technology innovation, and licensing transparency. So these are some key points that I will leave to, to consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, that's quite interesting. You are, you are in a way saying that uh, ease of doing business, okay? Government is out, need to enhance ease of doing business. 
that surely the funding will come, right? You see, so the funding will come, investment will come, but make sure, you know, it's friendly and uh, we can easily have ownership of it. Excellent. Great. Uh, I think this is uh, real interesting. Um, well, the man with many hats, he, uh, I, I think is going to really uh, tell us well, what are the other things, because Afghanistan is... Uh, is making, it's gone through a lot. I know during that period you went through a lot of challenges. And today, uh, it, it, we can see improvement. We can see improvement, steady improvement in Afghanistan. Melissa was telling me about uh, experience, very nice. So, uh, Mohammed, uh, can you uh, chime in on this? Uh, the things that enhance uh, investment, because right now there is huge investment in Afghanistan. Uh, good evening. Uh, such a pleasure uh, to be participating in this lovely session. Uh, see, Dr. Jameson, uh, there are a couple of things uh, that uh, really made the ICT sector of Afghanistan a success story. Uh, the first thing was that the government was uh, pretty much clear in the early days that where they want to move uh, in regards uh, to the uh, role of ICT uh, in the different uh, sectors uh, in terms of cross-cutting uh, phenomena uh, for the economic development. And that's why uh, we established the regulatory body. And uh, in the region, we were amongst the first countries uh, back in early 2000s where we opened our market for the private investment. And uh, uh, the good thing is that the rules of the game were uh, made very clear that what is the role and responsibility of the private sector and where the government will intervene. Uh, however, in between, we lost that vision, and uh, it got diluted. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, um, after the fall of the uh, Taliban government, uh, a new generation came, they took over, and uh, there was less of experience. More, mm, sometimes uh, the projects were led uh, by the international consultants, which was a good thing, uh, but the knowledge transfer uh, did not exist, that's why uh, it got uh, a bit uh, confusing uh, in the mid stages. Uh, however, again, uh, in the last uh, five years, uh, things are back on track. And uh, uh, one thing from my experience as the regulator, what I learned and I will build upon uh, what Jane said, is that it is essential for the uh, policymakers to understand that they can't do everything especially when it comes to the governments, they believe that, okay, they are the supermen and they are uh, having all the resources and they are having the law with them, the courts is in their controls and they can do everything. No. The reality is that we have to believe that if we want to really unlock the potential of the uh, ICT, we have to, from the core of our hearts, we have to believe in multi-stakeholderism. We have to give everybody a space and we have to respect uh, the role and responsibilities for everybody. And uh, uh, that's where uh, we are getting, in particular, uh, four years back, we introduced the open access policy. Uh, in the past, uh, we used to have still some monopolies like uh, the fiber optic uh, used to be only uh, the state investment. And uh, that is something uh, not uh, very positive. One more thing that I want to highlight, and it's not only about Afghanistan, but uh, all the uh, developing and least developed countries are facing the same problem. That we think the domestic ICT sector is the milking cow. Let's put taxes. And just uh, our Minister of Finance, uh, with all due respect to all of them, they sleep at night and in the morning they come up with an idea why not to issue this tax? Yeah, but you have got all those other sectors aviation, mining, go and kill those sectors. Why? A sector that is already generating uh, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars for you while you're trying to kill it. And likewise, uh, I would also like to add that there is a problem with the uh, LD, uh, yeah, LDCDs that majority of the users of the social media uh, active accounts are coming from these countries. However, when you go and see the statistics in regards to the uh, share of the revenue that uh, these countries are getting, it is 
unbelievable. It's so low. I'm just giving one example from Facebook. 1.4 billion active users are coming from LDCDs, which makes it like around 70% of the active users of Facebook. And let's go and see the statistics that what sort of revenue they are sharing with these countries. So um, one of the suggestions that uh, I would uh, put uh, to the LDCDs is that we have to really work collectively and find a solution on how to get a fair share uh, of the uh, revenue that these uh, multinationals are generating from our economies, but we are not receiving it back. Uh, last but not least, one of the problems when it comes to the connectivity is the unavailability of electricity. To me, uh, living in Afghanistan uh, and uh, my region as a whole, I can say that if there is no electricity, forget about connectivity. No connectivity without electricity. This should be our motto, and we have to really push uh, the agenda that electrification should be on the top priority uh, of our uh, policymakers in order to make sure uh, that uh, we get uh, the advantages and the benefits that is uh, hidden in the uh, use of ICT and uh, connectivity. Thank you. Excellent. You are also speaking as the chair of the Cabo School of Economics and Technology. <laughs> so I, I think they should cut and paste all that you are saying so we can uh, really unlock the potentials. Thank you so much Thank for you, the sir. exposition. And um, we'll, we'll move on to uh, this man, too, that is versatile, academic, and uh, is in business, is a coder, is a technology person. Uh, Mark, that's his girl. What is your perception about all this? From your perspective, what is, what, what can you say? Thank you very much, Imson. Um, I'm a big believer in digital technology and private sector working as a force to move things forward. And in thinking about that, I've decided to bring an example from Brazil, and it ties directly with the bureaucracy question that we were just discussing. So the banking system in Brazil has for decades been known to be very, very bad. And I don't mean that only in the efficiency sense, it's downright predatory. So taxes were off the roof for about anything a person wanted to do. And it just stifles and limits people and put them in a permanent state of debt with these banks. And it's something that policymakers probably wanted to address, but really could, could never get at it. And the banking system seemed to be doing just fine the way it was. So it took for a couple of fintech companies to really start looking at this a few years ago and say, you know, mobile phones are very widespread in Brazil, very accessible. Even lowest income people here have access to a cell phone. The internet is okay. There's 3G in most of the country, 4G in some parts. Why don't we make online banks, no friction, no agencies. We just make a bank for people to have somewhere to, to have money and have some credit. And this idea at first, of course, was met with a lot of problems by legislators. They, they were like, whoa, what is this? This is not, but they just pushed through. And what's interesting is this proved to be a hit uh, across all different sectors and all different social classes. All sorts of people were looking for a frictionless way to you know, be able to operate, have credit, and at the same time, don't be so tre treated in such a predatory manner. What happens is now, funny enough, with this success, legislators have to do what they do best, right? Look and say, oh, this is a thing. Now we need to have a conversation. Now there's actual reforms being made in the system as a whole, in the banking system as a whole, to make it work better and to make transactions less, more frictionless. So it forced the entire banking system to have a look at what they were doing. But that's my question. Had people not innovated and really used the most of technology to get banks in people's hands and make it frictionless, would that have been a thing? It wouldn't. 
It, it had never changed before, so it's directly tied. We can see direct, this direct tie. So how to, it's important to engage with policymakers, but sometimes you have no choice but to force them to think about policies. And especially in our overly bureaucratic countries, I think that is something that needs to be looked into, how to just push them instead of asking from them. Thank you very much. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Mark. That is quite some paradigm, you know. We get some uh, investors or entrepreneurs, they are champions, and they come up with innovative ideas, and that, in a way, mobilizes the policymakers to do the right thing. Right, Kosi, are, are you getting that? Okay, that, that is nice. And um, so we will we'll hear from uh, this, you can say, global uh, lady or champion, you know, is going around, so maybe will help us package how can we now get the best of all these uh, policy frameworks uh, so that at a go, we, we can really say this is what is most necessary for this. This, this will enhance this. This will uh, make us to unlock the potential. Melissa. So I've been part of something that I'm guessing all of you in the room haven't heard about. How many of you have heard of broadbandpolicy.org? Oh, have you? Awesome. Yay. Good. Yeah, <laughs> probably from yesterday. Um, and you know, the, I'll tell you a little bit about what this uh, what this initiative is. Um, so for the past year, I've been uh, working with uh, a couple of my colleagues and friends. So Mike uh, Tokic, who's over there. Hi, Mike. Um, Lydia Karun, who actually left uh, today. Both of them again are from uh, Microsoft, and we've been volunteering um, with uh, a creative agency by the name of Haddad and Partners, as well as a, a law firm called Oreg. And what we've been doing is we started thinking about this concept of how do you solve the SDGs if we don't have a single place where broadband policies exist or education policies. And so we decided to collect as many as we could. Because we saw a broadband commission report that said there were 157 policies or 160 some odd policies. So we said, all right, ITU, where do you have the policies? And we realized there were a lot of links and a lot of press releases, but a lot of those policies were not online. So if we couldn't find them, how can regulators know what is the best practice? And where's the single place for them to go? So if we talk about open data, where do they go to, to find out what is the, the greatest thing? You know, is it getting everybody in a room and talking? Or what if we collected all of them? What if we put them online? What if we localize them into English? Um, and I'm not saying that English is the only language, it was just our competencies within our team. And what if we put them through a natural language processing algorithm identified keywords and groupings of stuff that we considered best practices, like the inclusion of women and girls, digital skills, public access. We picked a whole bunch of different keywords and we created a data, visual, data visualization dashboard. We ended up collecting about 125, 130, we'll show you in a second, uh, policies uh, across 82 countries. We're about 50% done, we're not there yet, but we put it all online. And I'm hoping, Mike, if this works okay, are we able to pull up the, um, the website? So I think one, as Mike is working on this, so this is broadbandpolicy.org, I'll do a quick spin through of it. Um, so again, policies, natural language processing algorithm using keywords, and we use Power BI to showcase what's in these policies. And the whole idea is, let's provide access to information. What we haven't done yet is added all of the policies into the site. What this is enabling you to do is instead of going through and reading 82 policies, you can click on different bits and pieces within the tool and look at who's included gender, for example. 
And why does this matter? If you don't have a goal for gender inclusion, how are you going to achieve the goal of gender inclusion when it comes to ICTs or internet access, for example? If you've included nothing about digital skills, for example, in your broadband policy or in your you know, Ministry of Education policies, how are you going to empower the next generation of people to move from consumers of technology into creators, makers, and doers empowered by technology. Mike, I'd love you to talk us through um, maybe an example. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Thanks, Melissa. So let's take a look at, uh, so this is a Power BI, like Melissa said, that allows anyone to really play around with the data, um, policymakers or anyone in the public. and. If we wanted to look at certain keywords around accessibility, we have a keyword group that you can click on, and we can see here out of the 82 countries that we analyzed and the 136 policies that we ran through our natural languaging processing technology, around 30 of them actually had keywords around accessibility. So keywords like special needs, uh, disabilities, impairment, and we could even filter by region if you wanted to see, okay, who in Africa uh, and the continent talks about accessibility keywords. And we can see about seven countries mention uh, accessibilities uh, or ex uh, as, as a keyword grouping. And we can even see how many times these keywords are used. Uh, for example, in Tanzania, uh, accessibility uh, is mentioned six times in their policy. And this Power BI has a lot of different tabs that you can go through uh, with various data sources outside of these policy documents around internet penetration, internet inclusiveness, uh, internet freedom scores, but if you wanted to dive one click deeper into the policies themselves, we can go in and see, okay, what is the context around these keyword usages? Uh, so if we wanted to see for accessibility in Africa, we can actually see the country of Gambia actually mentioned the keyword disabilities 38 times, and we went in and pulled out each sentence that the word disabilities was used in Gambia, and we won't you know, it's, it's a lot of text here, but it was mentioned 38 times. We can see, you know, are they addressing uh, accessibility challenges in that policy, or are they just mentioning it? So it allows you to go one click deeper and really see across various regions or countries, you know, how are these keywords and challenges around digital inclusion being used? So, you know, the idea here is, you know, let's say, for example, you're a regulator and you want to take your... Uh, or a policymaker, and you want to take your broadband policy to, or your digital inclusion policy, or whatever it is, to the next level, this enables you to know who's got what covered. So you don't have to go out and sit in a room and be here at IGF, which I obviously encourage everyone to attend, um, and I t attend every year as much as I can. But, you know, how do you empower people with knowledge? Oh, we've still got some work to do. And we've still got some places I think that um, we could go to in terms of innovation uh, within the site. We'd like to take this and kind of think about, you know, is there a scorecard that we could put together? Is there, you know, some example language that we could highlight? So I see this as kind of, you know, version one, even though we've been um, working on this for about a year, we can look at any keyword groupings. We also have in this site um, the ability for anyone anywhere to upload a policy. So if anyone is um, listening or watches this later or is in the room and says, wait, hold on a second, where's my policy? I've got one. You know, you have an opportunity to, um, to upload, it, uh, upload it here. And they go to Mike over there. So um, he's the one who would collect it. And he's really the, the, the brains behind um, putting this together. Um, I, I'm going to switch over, and I know I'm going on a bit, but I, I want to make a couple more comments. But I think policy making is one thing, but we have to make sure we're not just defining policies. We're, you know, we're not just putting policies in place. We are, you know, implementing those policies. This is one way to come up with an objective and data-driven approach for policy creation. But it's really about how do we mobilize a multi-stakeholder um, group and think beyond connectivity and think about skills so that people are able to make meaningful use of the internet in front of them and again, move from being consumers of technology into creators, makers, and doers empowered by technology. Excellent, thank you very much. It, it, this is online right now, right? www.broadbandpolicy.org. Yep. 
www.broadbandpolicy.org. Anybody can go there. Mm -hmm. Okay, dot org. So this is available, available tool for anyone. The, to what use. you're seeing here is available to anyone anywhere. If you were to get out your phone or your laptop, you okay. can you can go to this site. And I look forward to the next innovation that will be coming out, which will be us housing all of the policies, the physical policies, and us doing some kind of uh, maybe some sentiment or maybe some scorecards and potentially looking at what innovations could come in terms of language. Excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, can we give them a big round of applause for this round? You've really done a good job. Thank you. Uh, do we have any question from remote uh, or anyone from the floor you want to ask? Yes. Uh, two minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to con congratulate uh, Melissa for the wonderful job. Indeed, it's something that could help me back when I'm in Afghanistan. And uh, I'm, I'm about to start uh, reassessing our broadband policy based on the new development. And this is the tool that could uh, be really helpful. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, and my next question is in regards to uh, digitalization. Uh, in countries uh, uh, like Afghanistan, where the uh, primary utilities like connectivity and electricity is uh, questionable and they are not being uh, uh, provided to the people, how do we uh, digitalize and what do we digitalize? And the other is how do we uh, uh, increase the demand for digitalization by the public, uh, which is a, a tricky part in countries where you are talking about uh, digital literacy at its uh, minimum level, and what sort of uh, uh, policies would encourage citizens and, uh, to, to adopt digitalization and use and challenge the way of currently they have been living for the past, let's say, 30 to 40 years, and then step into something new. So these are uh, the uh, areas that are uh, let, uh, needs uh, uh, further information from the panel uh, that they can provide uh, the information that will be helpful. Thank you. So, do you mind if I comment okay. on that? So, one? as okay. you respond, we could also delve on if you if there are some tools available, you know, that to help citizens to you know get digitally included for digital inclusivity. Thank you. So. Um, I, first off, I will see you in Afghanistan in uh, 2020. Second off, um, I think it's really important for us to have a standard for what it means to be digitally literate. I spent two years doing a literature review of um, all the different frameworks and definitions of what it means to be digitally literate, and I found that if you ask a thousand people, you get a thousand different answers. There's no global standard of what it means to be digitally intelligent. Um, so in this two years that I spent doing this literature review, I identified three that looked very interesting. And one of them that I identified was personally my favorite. It's uh, from the DQ Institute, which is a Singapore-based nonprofit. I uh, am working right now with the IEEE to, to standardize this framework. And so I think it's really important as we're thinking about how do we get people skilled up, that we have a standard of what that means. I look at it across not a spectrum of nine different things, and I'm happy to share this with you. Identity, so how do you manage your personal identity online? How do you have balanced usage? So how do you think about time management and screen time? How do you protect yourself online in terms of safety, security? But it's also about emotional intelligence. How do we empower people with all of these different skills, including communication, media literacy, Right, so what are, what are your rights in terms of privacy and life skills? And unless we have a standard curriculum that we roll out, and unless the ICT ministry is working together with the Ministry of Education, but not forgetting informal education, it's really impossible, I think, to create that demand because you're, you're not training people to become um, creators and makers. You're training them to be consumers. Mm, excellent. Wow, uh, the chair of Afikta. Uh, I just wanted 
to do both uh, applaud what uh, Melissa was, the projects that they have done, and also answer the, the question you have raised. Uh, in the same spirit of, uh, it seems that we are thinking alike, uh, Afecta started a few months back to have a project for the African continent, where we have the same map, but for Africa only, where we are trying to share all ICT digital transformation related information for each country. We don't dig deep, we are not doing analytics, but we, this is what we found that we are lacking. We don't know what is there at our neighbor. We don't know what policies are there. We don't know the structure of the organization there. We don't know the private sector there. We don't know the successful project implemented and the failures. So we learn from them. And so I, I invite everyone to have a look on uh, uh, this over uh, on AFICTA website. It is also work in progress, so we finished also something like 50% of it. But it has some information very interesting because at least people can talk to each other and learn from the lessons instead of try uh, all over again uh, uh, to do the same thing. The, the other point maybe that I want to, to, to share is that while we are doing so, we also are not doing enough in collaborating together on major transformation. So capacity building, if we are doing it in each country alone, again, we are doing the try and error. And also, it might be quite expensive for us. We need to train the trainers that would be doing the exact uh, uh, required homework. But an important thing is it is not only about raising capability of the youth, but it, it is also about raising the maturity of the elder that are the ones that are taking the decision. People that are heading the project and heading the government authorities, they need to have different mind and to understand the benefit of the digital transformation and the industry for. And, and they will not learn it by themselves. They need ways of creating the awareness and teaching them or explaining to them successful uh, projects that took place in other government and not from private sector, sometimes from another government that had been doing it previously. Uh, the one thing that we, we, we think is important, and I, I put this as a question, what we have in all our countries currently is TRA, right? Telecom Regulatory Authority. It is no longer valid. What we need is digital society regulatory authority. It's a different level where we are going to be able to enable more customer to utilize digital transformation for the benefits. Dig telecom, telecom regulatory authority is good to enable telecommunication and infrastructure. We need to move to the next step. And we need to see example of this, how it happened in other countries, so we can move faster on that track. Um, uh, keep it to this for now. Thank you. Yeah, I like that, you know, that tweet uh, you are bringing in, the twist you are bringing in uh, about transforming the regulatory authority. Uh, Kosi, you agree with that? Just as, yes or no? Do you? Yes, but it depends on our curriculum. We must change all the curriculum. Our school now must, must be changed globally. Because we have some training, we, we, and as we ask ourselves, is it normal to train people in this age like that again? We must take in consideration the evolution of technology when we make training for people today. That is very important. We, we, we still, again, in Africa, making digital literacy, technology adaptation, is not the way where we are in France, Germany, and world. We have, they invite the cyberspace with cyber defenders. We, we are here and looking at technology like something where we come to make, uh, what is my name, what is my family, is not normal. 
we must change all our process in Africa. That's the question that, uh, yeah. was, that we were asking. Should we move from a telecom regulatory authority to a digital society regulatory authority? Yes, for me, but it's a decision we must take at the parliamentary level. It's not uh, just uh, and, government. And, and what I'm also hearing from you is that you need to build a critical mass of uh, literate you know, citizens and as well literate uh, decision makers, you know, for there to be a proper understanding of the necessity of this transformation. China? Yeah, um, speaking from a civil society perspective, as of course, and give it off to Mark. Uh, Melissa, I think that tool is very useful and I've seen how other people have worked on it and built on it. But my question to you is how well received or how well engaged is it with governments and who else, and what drives, if you've thought about it, have you done to ensure that other people know that this tool exists beyond um, the IGF space? And I'm thinking capacity building training such as the African School of Internet Governance or even the Africa IGF Internet Governance Forum itself. I know this is a global tool, but that's something to, to think about in terms of um, how well has it been received and is there a strategy around engagement with this tool. And then the second response is around, I think, whilst we're speaking about policy and who should have the role, in reality is we're coming from contexts where um, we have internet shutdowns that are happening. We, ha we do not have enabling environments that if we're working towards making sure that youth are part of the digital economy, I've done research on how young people should participate in the digital economy and how they participate in the digital economy. What you do find is the lack of community support, the lack of actual investment from governments and policymakers to actually say that, okay, fine, you've come up with this idea, I will fund it and this is how it will work. So at the end of the day, whilst we're speaking about these beautiful policies and the beautiful level of which we can all engage with it, the reality on the ground is that we still have very problematic levels of social inclusion in the societies that we come in. I love that we talked about electricity, but we also need to talk about actually unpack, demystifying the way in which technology is seen within family structures and within schools themselves. And we also need to think about actually understanding, I'll come back again to the research base, actually understanding the way in which people are innovating in tough environments, because that is the reality from which most of us come from, where most people are still are actually making use of the internet which is very expensive with mobile devices with privacy issues but they're the only ones that they can take because they're probably cheaper. So I do think that is something that in all of this that we're talking about we need to take into account the reality on the ground. Okay, so Melissa, just let's hold on, you're going to respond but uh, let's take in more uh, feedback. I noted you know, from uh, what she has just uh, said right now that uh, there is, you know, total need to have a rethink, okay? Say, how do we train a critical mass? Are there some low-hanging food? Say, we need to be funded. Fund is scarce. So, are there some low-hanging food, maybe online tools, online materials that can help, you know, to broaden the skills level? So, please, you're going to respond. Mark, can you just say something? Thank you, Jimson. Um, I've done a lot of work with young people, and what I've learned is that sometimes you just have to show them that things are possible. So for a long time, I believed that maybe you need a structured approach to this kind of thing. I believed in like assembling courses, and, and then I started trying something different. I would just take a simple coding language like HML and show them, here, I'll type this out, and you see that it will do this thing. And that worked. That, they were like, really? So if I do this, it, this happens? Yes, that's what coding is. Because when you hear coding, everybody who's not a coder and, and hears about coding thinks it's this impossible thing that involves, it's not. There's levels of coding and levels of things. So my approach has been, when, I, when I'm called to try to work in education programs and things like that. I've stopped going so much for the, this holistic approach and coming down to this, we need to make this, this young people interested in things. And they won't be interested in courses, they're interested in seeing things that are interesting and cool. So 
why don't we make them? Why don't we teach them how to code games? It's still coding. They will still learn the skills. They will still become very competent IT people. So the approach sometimes is a bit wrong. We think of this major policies when, when at times well, all you need to do is to get them interested. And sure, some won't care. A few won't have the, the right skills for that, but a lot will. And the more we manage to actually get things to them and show that it's interesting, that's a net gain. That's how I've come to think of it. Uh, uh, this is Jimson speaking. Let's take uh, Paul, uh, intervention, then Melissa. The, 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 thank you, Chair. Uh, for, firstly, I, I, I think we, we need to understand the magnitude of what we need to do. You know, when we talk about unlocking the digital potential of the least developed countries, you know, and let me focus on Africa because that's where I'm from. We, we, we've got one of the fastest growing youth populations. We're, I think we're going to have the largest youth population in the world soon, if not already. Uh, we have some of the highest unemployment rates. We have some of the highest uh, inequalities between the rich and the poor. We've, we've got so many issues to deal with. And this is not going to be a grass bottom-up thing. It's not going to be a top-down thing. We do need good policy. We have good policy. We don't tend to implement policy well, but we, 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 we've got to create a conducive environment on the continent where we work together, where businesses work together, where there's funding to grow the tech companies. And, you know, I, I, I see my government uh, spending money on overseas technology. I see the same technology available on the continent, and we don't buy that technology. We don't because the person in the country that has a contract wants a cut and, uh, you know, it's these business practices and then they've got to be 50% Namibian owned, you know, or locally owned. So we, 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 we create barriers for the continent to thrive. And when we talk about the jobs of the future, the fourth industrial revolution, you know, we've got to be realistic. We will be competing on a global stage for these jobs. So we've got to deal with big issues. And it's not about getting a few people from the village to understand coding. It's not about uh, the tech companies investing in some nice little projects that don't explode. We, we need a revolution of change and a revolution on the way we think and do business. And we're getting there. I'm not, it, it's not all bad. You know, Africa is putting itself together. It, it needs to do it faster. Uh, we, 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 we have good tech companies on the continent, but we don't have an environment that allows them to grow out of being SMEs. You know, you do look at Silicon Valley. You know, I, I was in California the other day, and it, you know, there is a reason why so many tech companies have come from there. It's a conducive environment that's enabled it to grow with money and with the skills. You know, we have a lot of that, but we need to package it, and we, we've got to do it quick, because those jobs of the future are now, and our, our kids are sitting in schools that are disconnected. It, where I come from, 30% of our schools have internet connectivity, which means 70% of schools don't. So how do we make them digitally literate? You know, we've got people teaching computers in schools without computers. It's mad. So we, we've got to solve these problems, and we've got to solve them today. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, Paul, it's quite uh, striking that we, we can't afford to do just uh, little, little things. We have to make, really do it big. Wow. Melissa, back to you. All right, so big stuff. Um, so I, I heard a few different things, and keep me honest to make sure I, I respond to everything, but I think one of the questions was around we want to get skilled up, where do we go? You talked about this framework and you talked about these things. How do I go and find this content? I think the biggest challenge uh, when it comes to content and curriculum is local content, local language content, right? I can point you to some stuff that I've created, some things that I think are interesting. But if you think about all of the different languages that people are speaking around the world, you know, is that content available in, in that local dialect? And are those examples appropriate in that particular you know, community? Not necessarily. So I'll point you to a blog that I wrote um, back in October. And this is something that um, I put together. Um, I, I work at IBM as well. And one of my roles at IBM is uh, developer advocacy and digital skill building. I also wear a lot of hats. I have my own nonprofit where I've taught tens of thousands of kids to code in 12 countries. I don't believe that everyone should be an engineer. Maybe 10, 20% of the digital literacy classes I run, people are actually interested in it. 
So the blog post, you can find it at ibm.biz, so B-I-Z, slash digital intelligence. And it's not just about, when I wrote this blog post, it's not just about, all right, let me just shove some IBM stuff at you. It's an industry review of what do I think are some interesting tools. And I, I think one, you and I forgot your name from Brazil, my friend from Brazil. Um, you mentioned something about you know, running cool coding camps or doing cool things that will get people interested. One of my favorite things um, to use to introduce young people to the introductory building blocks of learning to code is either through code.org or Hour of Code or Scratch. I've done that a ton of times, even with four-year-olds, and it you know, really demystifies computer science in a way that is you know, fun and engaging. It gamifies uh, computer science. So you're not just coming in and talking about algorithms. You know, al even uh, the word algorithm sounds, sounds scary. I think that's um, you know, a couple of things. But I think the other piece, too, is we've got to have locally created and grown solutions. And you're not going to have locally grown and created solutions in local language content unless people have skills, the skills to make an application or a website or to make that content. So it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario. Did I answer everything or did yeah, I forget yeah, yeah. something? Yeah, no, no, that, is, that is cool. That is OK. Cool. You want to chime yeah, in? There? Let me add on this one. Uh, I think I would look into this uh, issue uh, from two different perspectives uh, by saying that uh, one statement that uh, one size does not fit all. Uh, I agree with Melissa that we really do not need uh, the whole country to know uh, blockchain. We don't need them to be coding. Like, what we, will we do with the coding at the end of the day? Um, I think uh, we have to really categorize uh, the skills uh, and the requirements of skills. That, okay, um, uh, what sort of people uh, should be going for the high skill uh, uh, or advanced uh, digital skills? And we should go with the basics. And then also, oh, for me, I do not want to learn online marketing and uh, social media management and all those things at this age. So um, I'm sure that there is uh, age-wise uh, as well as well as uh, uh, there should be categories. Uh, uh, that's what I'm trying uh, to say here. Uh, that uh, we cannot really uh, ask everybody to do everything we want them to do. Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing, again, uh, Melissa touched upon it, is Local uh, content, uh, context is uh, very important. Uh, in the last two days, I have been talking uh, with different friends uh, because I'm also running a nonprofit and uh, I'm working on digital skills. At least, do we have some guidelines that we should follow? I don't want the specific content that, okay, this is Go what Go to I my blog to... post, you'll find them. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, this is a message that we have to promote and we have to make it a more uh, uh, common thing. And uh, people coming from these poor countries, uh, from uh, the developing countries, they should not feel shy that, okay, we don't have those many coders uh, to come and train all our kids. I don't want my daughter really to be a coder if she doesn't want that. So uh, with this, I will stop it here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we need to be diversified and enhance whatever diversity that we have. Yeah, Gonzalo? Well, jumping on, um, on these uh, skills, um, going just in a personal note, um, I'm, I'm, I'm graduating in computer science, and um, the purpose of learning to code is not to be engineering. The purpose of learning to code is to solve problems. That's what the next revolution is asking us. And we'll, we'll, we'll demand from everybody. I have a 14-year-old daughter. I'm teaching her her code. But not to be an engineer. She wants to be architect or something like that. No, it's to solve problems. And most importantly, aligned to that is creativity. So we are assisting the fourth industrial revolution is an exposure of machines. Machines will take over many, of, many jobs that we currently do today. So what humans are best is solving problems with creativity. So, and I end up even asking about, we have to be creative in teaching coding. With friends, with uh, childs of my friends, I teach them coding. With two 
glasses of, uh, of yogurt or, or two glasses of water and a bowl. We don't need, comp well, it's important to have in schools uh, technology, access to technology, but most important is it's, it's not technology itself, is what we take out of it. So technology in schools shouldn't be a goal it's in itself. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's really, really important. Now in a more professional um, tone is, is educating edu uh, students and reskilling workforce. It's an imperative not only for, uh, it's not only a responsibility of schools, college of, or universities or even governments. Um, it's a community effort. Uh, an industry like us must play a substantial role on, on, on improving education and developing the workforce. So let me give some examples. Um, in, 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 uh, with, a, with a program we have, it's called at and Aspire and Escuela Plus, we connected teachers and students with educational content. Actually, we committed $500 million uh, to this project since 2008. In, in 2018, 900, 300 plus schools in nine Latin American countries were impacted by this program, Escuela, Plus, Escuela in Spanish is Escuela Plus, or Escuela, Escuela Mas. Mas. Escuela Mas. Uh, another example, for instance, in, in Malaysia, AT&T uh, Malaysia Communications, um, hosted, has been hosting for the last six years the Developers Day. And here, well, it's an event that is designed to encourage and aspiring developers, but he has a purpose. It's just for developers, for those who want to be developers. Um, and entrepreneurs to create something around the Internet of Things. That's one element of the fourth industrial revolution, just one. Uh, and, and, and last year, the emphasis was on apps that use uh, artificial intelligence and big data analytics to solve real needs. So, you see, we have to use technology for the good, not just for the sake of using technology. We have to give them a purpose to solve our problems. And the, the, the winning app was an artificial intelligence enabled solution that lets trash bins automatically identify materials for recycling. So here also a contribution to a, a global issue, climate change. So is this a kind of the examples which is a, a community effort from governments, from schools, and also from companies on which we are deeply engaged to, and also putting some money. Yes, uh, very good. Uh, really solving problem, that is the main message. You know, whatever we do is to solve the problem locally, but we need to do it big. We need to uh, uh, expand the horizon of the youth to acquire the skills so that they can solve the problem. Okay, uh, is we have anybody on remote? Okay. Uh, okay, just uh, quickly, I want to ask a question. Yes, I, I have a question. Uh -huh. my, my name is Lekwe. I'm a lecturer of law at the University of Botswana. Now, developing countries missed the bus under the WTO system. That is why a lot of patchwork had to be done afterwards to address the needs of the least developing countries and, and developing countries. So I think it is a good thing that we are addressing these questions at the time when uh, we are moving towards formulating international standards. Now my question is, in this area, in this subject, do developed countries have any responsibilities in assisting the least developed countries and developing countries to, to unlock the digital revolution in in their countries, and if there are responsibilities, what specifically can developed countries do? And the second part of the question is, are there any, do we need to be cautious in inviting develop, developed countries to, to assist? Thank you. Okay, so Melissa, you just take that, and yeah, Jane, and then uh, Uzam will take the last one. So I, I just wanted to comment on one of the, the things that my friend um, from at and mentioned. Um, so when I run uh, my coding camps, um, which mainly is in uh, Tunisia right now, and I've done it in about 12 different countries, but Tunisia is where I'm most active. When we run our camps, it's not just about learning to code, it's about defining 
a problem that they want to solve. And they start there. And it's something that is aligned to the SDGs. And then they look at the data. What data is supporting this problem? And they learn about media literacy so that they understand what is valid data that they can use to prove whatever it is, you know, whatever the problem is. And then they look and they do industry research. And they look at what other, you know, things have been implemented to solve this problem and what it makes yours different. They look at um, who's the audience. They look at timeline and they look at business models. And the reason why I think this is important is it goes back to what you said around, um, it's not just about building technology for the sake of technology, but building something that's solving a problem and creating a need. And I think there's another reason why this is important. Many, I think, universities and schools from around the world, young people come out of university or come out of high school knowing how to take tests, knowing how to memorize stuff, but they don't necessarily know uh, the practical side of the real world. That's one thing I just want to comment. Then one more thing regarding what role does um, develop, do developed countries have in terms of implementing um, or bringing digital skills or bringing digital inclusion. My nonprofit that um, is headquartered in Tunisia, we receive funding from the US Department of State. And we operate because of that funding. And over the course of five years, we've received hundreds of thousands, or maybe 300,000, something like that is in total. So not, we're not talking about huge money, but it makes a difference. And my team is able to do really interesting work. And without that funding, they wouldn't be doing the work that they're doing. So I think there are funding sources available. And that's just an example of something that I personally have taken advantage of. Thank you. Jane? I would just say um, to your question is that uh, before someone had mentioned the importance of local training, we often will come in at the request of a team to provide more technical training so that the local people are trained to train local people. This is the only way that we have seen sustainability happen, whether it's for um, putting an, inter an internet exchange point or a community network or for people to learn more skills to deploy IPv6 or BGP at the IX. So there are some other tools and or ways that organizations like the Internet Society and others come together. We take people from policymakers, regulators, the European Commission, parliamentarians, and we bring them to the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. The IETF is a standards body that created the Internet standards. So we bring policymakers to a special program at our expense, very neutral, where you learn from the people who deploy the standards and who created them about routing, how the internet works, different aspects of encryption, routing security, time security. And you sit and listen and get as much out of that as you want in a group that is only policymakers and regulators so that you can go see what the standards body's like participate, but then come back and hear more, and it's free training. That type of thing integrates people into the standards body, but also you understand that there are different standards bodies that have important relationships to what you're doing as a regulator or policymaker. The last thing I would say is Wi-Fi changed things dramatically. If we hadn't allowed unlicensed spectrum and the Wi-Fi standard to exist, we might not be where we are today with some new deployments of technology. So we've really got to stop and think about accepting new things that might come along and different ways of working. Um, with internet exchange points and community networks, we often bring teams to a place, again, train local people, but it's usually the human engineering that's the hardest part. And so we will spend time with regulators and policymakers, rely on people like you to bring the right people to the table. So we'll do best practices training and technical training. But again, it has to be locally owned and locally sustained. Because if it's not a local solution, we don't know your countries and we don't live there. We're not going to presume that we do know the right solution. You help us find that solution so that it's sustainable, whether it's a government regulatory policy solution or a technical solution. Excellent. That's cool. So we have a remote uh, intervention. What is that?
can we do that in the next uh, one minute? Yes, uh, thank you for the flow. My name is Joseph from the remote hub in Kampala. Uh, a lot has been discussed and I really appreciate uh, what has been discussed. Uh, I will take you back to the point where there was a, one of the people who had the flow said that uh, there is a need to get a few people to train, to have trainers or trainees to go train in different uh, capacities and different uh, communities. For that, I, in my own perspective, I would say it would be much better if um, the, the, uh, the people training, if it is the space to train the trainers to go and train, I would suggest that it would be much better to directly go and train, to cut costs and cut uh, time of operation or to have a larger impact. Because we can't be certain, or I wouldn't, personally I wouldn't be certain to, uh, delegate uh, so much effort or such uh, entitlement or power or task to someone who has been trained in a short period of time or longer period of time, regardless of the time of training. If I, if I know I have the potential to do it myself, less, I could suggest that let's use the available resources to actually have impact. Secondly, regarding the uh, global South and all these uh, uh, impacts with uh, entrepreneurship and all the that has been said, I would say that one of the aspects that I've not had uh, being discussed is the brain drain. Yes, the trainings are happening, uh, programming and coding, this stuff is happening. But even with some of the people that would have stayed to have uh, increased impact in Africa, are, uh, actually leaving Africa to the Western countries and uh, to countries in, uh, in, with bitter syphias. So I, I suggest that um, it, as a society, as a community, because I believe that if we stand as a community, we have a, a wider uh, uh, point of view and stronger efforts and stronger sound of or tone of voice. So I suggest that as the space, we lobby for uh, for good and uh, better CFIAs of operation in Africa, that the people that have, have the knowledge to operate on the impact Africa remain in Africa. I'll stop okay. there. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, the chair of AFICTA, Uzam, can you respond to that and also uh, have the last word? So, uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, the remote uh, participant. Uh, just answering regarding trains a trainer. Uh, it is just a way of using the same fund to implement much faster and to implement m much more trainees uh, in all the countries, uh, especially that we don't have enough fund to have face-to-face uh, -face training everywhere. In fact, we need to encourage more trains the trainers, remote training and online training so we can have more uh, uh, bridging more the digital divides that we have. Now, if you allow me, I'll put the recommendation from a FICTA perspective at least. Uh, in addition to all the good efforts taking place, we need more bridging foster the gap through south-to-south uh, -south discussion uh, and African country stakeholders sharing of policies and projects knowledge, capabilities, strategies for digital transformation and related transformational capacity building. Without sharing the knowledge, we keep on expanding much more and getting less ROI. Uh, we need also to engage the users, as mentioned by our colleagues. In fact, even for the IGF, we need people coming from the health sector. We need people coming from the education sector. We need people coming from the industrial sector. Those are the users that are going to benefit from uh, uh, the digital transformation and from uh, the, uh, the, the um, policies that will be that will enable them and the more they are uh, um, uh, believing in uh, the value of the digital transformation the faster we would be able to achieve the results required so creating awareness about this added value of digital transformation and in industry for to uh, uh, citizen but mainly super users is extremely important. 
uh, we need to engage further the parliamentaries, parliamentarians. Uh, um, and uh, I applaud what was happening in this IGF, uh, where we, we saw much more parliamentarians coming, which is important because they are the ones that are generating the policies. And the more they understand the value of the digital transformation, the more they would be engaging and really moving forward uh, to finalize the policies required. Uh, I think we need to engage together in complementing strategic projects, whether infrastructure backbone, whether local access points, content, certainly content. Instead of each country doing its own, if we share the same language in some of the countries, we should share content development together. We should share strategic projects related to education, health, agriculture, uh, and uh, uh, um, administrative reform. Um, uh, we need stronger collaboration for Africa. We need stronger co collaboration between Smart Africa, AFICTA, UNDESA, civil society, and other stakeholders. We need to work much more on the ground together. Uh, we need to think really, and this is a big question for all government, we need to move from the telecommunication regulatory authority to the digital society regulatory authority. By this is not about regulation only, it is about enablement. It is about standards. It is about um, a strategic vision. If we don't have a body that can put this, we are not heading anywhere. Uh, and finally, I uh, invite Melissa to support uh, AFICTA Information Hub and to integrate it with the Broadband uh, for All initiative. And thank you very much. Done. Thank you. Okay, great. So we have a quick agreement uh, on this panel. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you, Chair AFICTA. Uh, thank you, everyone. Unlocking the digital potentials of developing and least developed countries is something that can happen. It is going to happen very soon. I uh, want to encourage policymakers uh, to embrace all the, the uh, talking points. Many have been made today. Uh, embrace them. Let us uh, put resources into uh, all these points for solution. Let us be user-centric, be people-focused in our policy design. Let us collaborate, as the Chair of FICTA emphasized. Let us uh, look at all the tools that are available so that we can be able to solve the problem locally. Tools for coding, yes, is, is, is good. It will help with the, solve, with, with the solving of problem locally. And as we solve problem locally, then we are removing the digital divide. And as we remove the digital divide, then we are players in the fourth industrial revolution. It's uh, something that is doable, and the panelists I've said, yes, we can do it. And you out there, you also say, yes, we can do it. So on this note, I want to say thank you very much. We're already short of time. Uh, thank you so, so much. All right, uh, thank you all. Thank you, all our panelists. Can we put them, give them a big hand? And all of you, thank you. Thank you for coming. End of workshop. Thank you, Paul, for uh, arranging for this event, yes. my friend.